Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, I have a pleasure and honor to, to chair this uh, meeting together with Stan Krajewski, that you, every, I, I think <laughs> every, everybody knows Stan. Uh, and I will um, make a little introduction to the first part, and then Stan will introduce uh, our today's speakers. Uh, so, um, Dov Gabba and uh, Timoteus Kampik, and uh, I would like to say a few words about ourselves <laughs> and why we are here. I mean, uh, all of you know Stan, uh, who is a great logician, mathematician, and philosopher, um, known as the one who, who introduced the classes of uh, satisfaction first, and then uh, he had a, a, a lot of works on Gödel's theorem and uh, the relationships between logic and religion. And this is why we, we had a great pleasure to co-organize with Jean-Yves and uh, Ricardo the Second Congress uh, on Logic and Religion uh, in, in uh, 2017 in Warsaw, uh, where we had such speakers as um, Saul Crook, uh, Michael Heller, and Dov Gabay, who, who presented this project that he will say something uh, about today. Um, and then we had a great opportunity to, to prepare a volume, a theological discourse and reasoning. I give you a link, direct link to this, uh, to this volume here on the chat. Um, some of the papers are in open access, some of them, uh, unfortunately not, but uh, we invite you to, to, to see what's inside. Uh, so it was also a great adventure to, to prepare it together with our authors. Um, and we are still somehow <laughs> in this topic of logic and religion. Uh, it is very nice that also the younger generation had a nice response to this idea. We have now a new scientific uh, circle established by students from the University of Warsaw, uh, the circle of uh, logic and philosophy of religion. And we are kind of mentors, <laughs> me, Stan and me, of, the, of these students. Um, so this adventure is, is going on so all, all the time. And now we, we hope yeah, to, to organize together the, the third and fourth uh, Congress as well. Uh, and now uh, we have a new idea, so the association that will somehow combine all the, these um, the activities, uh, be a basis for them. So I'd like to ask Ricardo to introduce us to, to this idea and say something about this association called LARA. Ricardo, microphone is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you, Jean-Yves, for, for the invitation. Uh, hello, everyone. Yeah, so, so Martin has already um, said something about, about what I'm going to say right now. Uh, so uh, my, my, my topic is this association, LARA, the Logic and Religion Association. Um, from a general point of view, I might say, and Marcin has already mentioned that, that uh, its goal is to somehow advance research in this field that we might call logic and religion. And this is, this is being achieved mainly through this, this, uh, this uh, 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 Congress series, the, the World Congress on Logic and Religion, and also through manuscript publications, of course, and also to the realization of other scientific events. And uh, I'm going to speak a bit about that. I, I want to show you our website. Okay, but before of that, uh, uh, before that, I think I should I should mention two things, if you allow me. I mean, it, 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 it won't be new, perhaps, but perhaps I, I, I should mention that. The, the, the first one concerns uh, this field that, that we are calling here logic in religion. I mean, some people might find it strange to see these two words together in the same expression, logic and religion. How come logic and religion, what they have to do with each other? Is, is there such a thing as a research field called logic and religion? Of course, any informed person knows that although logic may appear 
to be opposed to religion, both have a long history of cooperation, right? We have centuries of attempts to, to, to develop and analyze arguments for and against the existence of God. We have also a kind of project of showing that um, the concept of God is coherent, or you might say consistent, which can also be shown to be a logical uh, enterprise. And from the point of view of contemporary philosophy of, of the religion, these two projects are kind of the two main fronts of the debate over the rationality of, of Theistic belief. And in addition to that, we know that many, many religious traditions, uh, they, have, they have somehow or other uh, used logical concepts and logical tools. Uh, but still, despite of this, it, may, it, may, it, it might seem odd to talk about a research field called logic and religion. So in one sense, I, I might say here that the, the, the goal, one of the goals of this association, Lara, is in some sense to dispel this oddness and, and consolidate logic and religion as a recognized research field. And as far as the Congress is concerned, they will call on, and again, I'm going to speak about it in a few minutes. Uh, this is achieved, of course, by providing conditions where logicians from all fields, as well as theologians from all religions, can gather together to hear from each other. Yeah, why not to say about the latest de developments in, in logic and religion. Um, a second thing that I, that I should mention is that this association is quite new. It, it, it in fact, was created this year. But um, uh, uh, Marcin mentioned a, a little bit about its histories. It, it, its origins date back to, in fact, to 2014, when myself and Jair we conceived the first World Congress on Logic and Religion, which took place in, in a city, in a Brazilian city called João Pessoa, the next year, the following year, 2015. Uh, and the second World War call uh, was held in 2017, as Marcin mentioned, in Warsaw, Poland. It was hosted by, by, by himself and by Stan. And we had distinguishing scholars in, in both congresses, such as Richard Swinburne, Jean-Pierre Declair, uh, so Kripp, and Bob Gabay also, who, who's going to speak today, among others. And in 2018, we announced the third World, Co World Congress on Logic and Religion uh, that would take place in the, one of the most famous holy cities in the world, Varanasi, India. But unfortunately, due the, to the COVID crisis, we had to postpone twice the Congress. But now it took place uh, in November of 2022 uh, at Banaras Hindu University in Varanasi, India. Okay, so after this short introduction, I would like to share uh, with you um, our website, and I will finish in five, six minutes, perhaps, just to give you a wider idea of the whole thing. So I suppose you are seeing our website now. So the, the, this is the page of, of, of our association. So we have we have a short presentation, we have the executive board, and we have the scientific board, and we have also a bit of history and some, some partner institutions. Um, okay, besides of that, we, we had some, some, some publications related to, to our congresses. Marcin mentioned some of them. Uh, uh, last year, uh, uh, we published by Springer this anthology. Uh, called Beyond Faith and Religion. Uh, we have three special issues of Logical Universalis, the one which Martin just mentioned, and two others, no, 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 two, sorry, two special issues of Logical Universalis, two special issues of, of the Journal of, of Applied Logics, and one special issue of, of Sophia. So that, these are, these are our, our publications. Um, Okay, uh, so we have here a page that, that, that shows the, the, the previous congresses. So beside the, the two congresses that I mentioned, we had also like a special edition in the uh, World Logic Day. It was, it was an online congress. So if, if you click here, we're gonna find information about all these congresses. Uh, this is the second one, which, which took place in Poland. And this is the first one, 
which, as I said, took place in um, here in Brazil. Uh, so our third Congress, hopefully, will take place next year, November, in Varanasi. So call for papers is open. We, are, we already have many submissions, and we expect to, to have more, OK? So here's the, the call for papers, keynote speakers, and more details will come, will come soon. But one, one, a new thing about this, this, this Congress is that uh, inside the Congress, we are going to have several workshops. So uh, in each workshop, we'll have its, its, its keynote speaker or keynote speakers and its chairs and so on and so forth. So they are somehow independent, but they take place inside the Congress. So, so far, we have seven workshops, one about consciousness and the self, other about formal natural theology, Judaism, Christianity, and logic. The third one, logic and religion, Schopenhauer. Logical pluralism and logical revision, mathematics and religion. And finally, logic of paradise. Uh, I'm going to write in the chat the, the, the address. So if you wish, you can, you can take a look at the website. And finally, we are going to start. This is not yet in the website, OK? But we are going to start next month a series of webinars. It will be uh, one webinar per month. So there will be a page in the website with the dates, with the, the, the name of the speakers, and so on and so forth. So you are all invited to attend. And that's it. I think I was pretty clear. Hey, so thank you very much, Ricardo. Um, uh, now, um, although we are all waiting for our main guests, uh, let's have a short uh, uh, questions and answers uh, session. If you have any question, please. Uh, ask now, uh, perhaps you'd like uh, to know something ask more. One question? Uh, yes, please. Uh, yeah, since it is in Varanasi, uh, I was wondering whether there is any uh, any session on Indian logic or uh, like that. Yeah, in in the uh, next uh, um, sure, congress. Sure. Yeah, see, see, because you are organizing the congress like that, as any other congress. Okay, once we have all the accepted submissions. Mm -hmm. We are going to divide those 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 presentations into into teams, and we have already a lot uh, many submissions on on Indian logic and Indian philosophy. So certainly there will be okay one or more sessions on Indian logic and Indian philosophy. That's sure, but th that uh, 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 we are going to let people know about that just when the the, the calendar. Of the of the Congress is made available, but beside that, there still might be other uh, workshops, and we we do want that there will be at least one workshop related to Indian religion or Indian philosophy. So 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 the, the, that list of workshops is still open. So 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 probably there will be one workshop related to uh, to Indian stuff. Okay, thank you. Uh, I was, uh, may I answer a little bit? Answer to the question, add to your answer? Sure. Uh, there is, uh, uh, I've been working uh, through the University of Luxembourg with a group in uh, Vienna uh, of uh, Agatha Ciabatoni and Erika Fresh. They work on the, uh, similar to the way we do Talmudic logic, they do the logic of the holy scripts of the uh, Mimamza. Mm -hmm. uh, so you could invite her, that, that group. I'll put in a chat uh, just a letter's paper they sent me. Okay, okay, thank you. I, I, I see it. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, this is a good initiative, what you're doing. Uh, it's very good, all this uh, logic and religion, the, the source of everything. <laughs> Thank you. In a way, yes. <laughs> so generally, uh, please feel uh, free to invite any people you, you think would, that you would be interested in taking part yeah, in yeah, yes, the yes. next and the next, next uh, <laughs> congresses. Yeah. <laughs> Also, so sorry, Martin. And also, I, we, we, I have to say that this workshop idea, I mean, as I said, it's like event, an event inside an event. So anyone who wants to, to chair a specific workshop, just let us know. 
okay? And, and there, might, there might be per, at least three more workshops. So our team is still, is still open. If someone, some of you want to join, please let us know. Okay, are there any other questions? Yeah, yes, I want to say something, Peter. Yeah, I've contributed to uh, a volume edited by Marcin on, on uh, I've, I've contributed on thought experiments and I will also, <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> yeah, very good. And um, uh, I will also be contributing on uh, religious thought experiments for the conference in Varanasi. Uh, but now I would like to invite you, I, I guess it's open, um, to a conference in the Philippines. Uh, it was also a philosophical event. Uh, Emerging philosophies of religion in Southeast Asia, second summit of the Union of Societies and Associations of Philosophy in the Philippines. Conference mm -hmm. dates uh, July 21, July mm -hmm. 24. So I will be contributing probably on koans and uh, uhuatos, uh, this uh, kind of Buddhism. But you can find it in, in uh, philosophical events. Okay, so we'll check it. Thank you very much, CP, yes, for yes. sharing this information. Yeah, Yeah, and very I would nice. like to ask uh, for my um, contribution in, in Varinasi. I would like to include uh, Judaist uh, proofs of God's existence as well, and probably miracles. Uh, if you have any information about this, uh, especially relating to logic, uh, then I would like to receive, of course. Um, yeah, in, in Varinasi, I would like to show not only Christian thought experiments, but also Hindu, uh, Judaist, etc. Okay, so please, yeah. CPE, uh, use the chat to, to leave your contact, please. Uh, so yeah, yes, yes, my anyone contact, yeah, yeah. can mm. help you, I think, uh, we'll do mm. it. Okay, are, are there any other questions, or mm. we skip to the second main main part of our meeting i see no hands on so okay so please stand <laughs> yes take the mi microphone and introduce our main guest thank you yes so uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce at uh, this webinar uh, dov gabai uh, who is a such an important logician that you know he, he hardly needs introduction. If there is anyone in the world who is able to, you know, to take any input, input, and to uh, transform it into logic, it's Dov Gabay, and he has done it in his many papers and books, including uh, some uh, very important handbooks that are well known. Uh, like a handbook of philosophical logic and and other handbooks, I will not be list. Uh, I'm not going to list them. It would be it take too long, and also it's very easily available everywhere. So we are very happy that Dov Gabay is will be presenting this program, uh, this project, and together doing this together with Tim Tim, Tim Kampik from Umia University, uh, and. Uh, who is much more junior, I must say. I, I'm just helping though. <laughs> but or I'm uh, trying to help. No, 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 no. But you are, you know, on your way, I understand, to, to go, uh, you know, the same way as Dov did. He, everything is before you. So, so we're very happy. And, uh, the, and of course, this is the Talmudic logic project. And the Talmud is a very important and very huge body of no, of uh, religious law and and the way to uh, extract logic from it is, in, is is very hard and it's very interesting how it is done but even more interesting i think is the way to uh, how to you know make the the talmudic uh, inspirations for formal logic possible because this is also a, is a very new sort of um, approach to logical matters. Okay, so the floor is yours, gentlemen. I understand that you'll be speaking, it's like one presentation, two parts of it. The first part is by Dov Gabay and the second by Timotheus Kampik. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am honored to uh, speak at this important, really important conference, and I thank you for all the good things you're saying about me. 
and uh, let us start. Uh, next, next slide. Okay, the, uh, the Talmud is a body of debates about laws coming from the Bible and you need to follow in your everyday life. So in the first, from zero after Christ to about 300, the Talmud was formulated. And then from about 300 to until, until today, they were more and more interpretation and debates about the Talmud. And the, the challenge by looking at the Talmud is to look through, uh, there's about um, uh, 40, uh, many volumes, 40 volumes of Talmudic debate and interpretation and all of that. And people argue, express opinions, but you don't know what model they have in their minds. So you have to build a logical model, logical principles for the various issues. It could, it could be an issue of resistance, an issue of mixture, temporal conditionals, all kinds of things. And in that model, go through all the important examples of similar debate in the Talmud and explain them consistently. So if Rabbi Shkop or Rabbi this or Rabbi that says this or Maimonides says this and that and that and that in every instance in the Bible, in the, in, in the Talmud, your model has to explain it. And for this, to do it, you need a logician and you need a rabbi who knows the Talmud very, very in a detailed way that also understands what it means to model. So it has to be ex-physicist or ex-mathematician or it's something or, uh, uh, and that's what makes a team. Okay, so we worked on this for some years and I think did 14 or 15 books. Each book is on a certain aspect of logic and aspect of the debate in the Talmud. And lo and behold, there are principles there that can be exported to, model, to modern AI. And because of this, the University of Luxembourg is, uh, I think you have to study Talmudic logic if you are doing a PhD. And they, uh, they, uh, in, in, in the University of Vienna, they using similar methods on the Mimamza because they have their also religious debates. Uh, and this is the way we are working. So what's in today's lecture? Next slide. Okay, here's the Talmud. Next slide. I mean, they are very heavy, these books heavy also to carry. So we apply, I've said that. Next. Okay, this is Rabbi Shkop. Oh, oh all right. Here, uh, here, here we start. I'll give you two examples. One from how to break loops in the Talmud, learning from the Talmud, and that method, the Shkop opinion, the Shkop method, ca can be exported to AI, and the next half of the lecture is an implementation of, the, of a modified Shkop method for argumentation network, which is a large area in AI. Uh, and the other example will be from temporal conditionals, uh, uh, which I will explain. And then Tim will take over showing how the mathematics work from that export. There is also export from temporal logic, but that's a bit more complicated. All right, so uh, to explain the type of loop you get, we start from a modern example. This is uh, J. Uh, what you see is a picture of J.K. Rowley's and her, and her father. She, she wrote the uh, books of Harry Potter, very famous. 
she gave a, a set of books signed by her as a gift to her dad. This was in the British newspaper. Her, her dad needed some money and he sold the books. A bit, a bit odd, I, I, I must tell you. Next. Okay, so here we have a Talmudic like uh, loop. Because when you give a gift like this, you give it as a gift, you can't sell it. I have gifts from my mother in law, it's uh, somewhere here, I can't sell it. All right. And very simple. But look at it from that point of view. The condition of a time zero, the condition of the gift being a gift is that you don't sell it. And if you sell it, it's no longer a gift. It's no longer yours. So here we get a loop. Time zero, it, the, the, the books belong to his, uh, her father. Time one, he sells it. He violated the condition of the gift, and therefore it's not his, therefore he can't sell it. If he can't sell it, he's not selling it, it's his. If it's his, he can sell it. If he sells it, it's not his. That's the loop. Next. In modern argumentation network, you have a loop like this. I mean, think of it, A, B are two people as a, as a mathematical loop. A says B is lying, B says A is lying. So, in modern logic of this, modern argumentation, you say you have a choice who you want to believe. I mean, you go to court, there are two witnesses, you say, um, uh, uh, one saying one is lying, the other saying, like, I mean, you believe one of them. Okay, or you don't believe either of them, but something happened, so you have to believe one of them. Uh, the Talmudic logic, by the way, has special rules for that. It's not as simple as that, but we are not into, into this. Here, you can't say, all right, A, I mean, what is A? Gift of, of a books, B, sell the books. You can't say, I accept selling the books because there is a, a temporal, you can't sell if it's not a gift. So the Schopp principle says, the last action causing the loop is illegal. That's how we solve the loop, but this is in the context of actions. Now I'll give you a more, a more interesting loop. Next. Okay, so this is a divorce loop. This is from the, from the Talmud. A husband and wife, the husband gives divorce to his wife at time zero. They have children, let's say one child, and the man is religious. He said, I'll give you a divorce. You can have a custody of the child, but the divorce is valid only on the condition that when the child time to go to school, let's say, when is the school? Time three, right? You send him to a religious school, okay? If you don't do that, you are not divorced because the causality goes backwards. This is the backward conditional in time. Fine, so she says, yes, I'll do it. At time one, she is divorced because it's not yet time to send the child to school. So she has husband number two uh, and she registered the children for religious school. Everything is ready according to the agreement. And then again in time two, she has an accident. She is mentally incapacitated. Husband number two takes over. And this has a religious school. I mean, no, 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 no. I am sending to a modern school, right? But by going to a modern school, the divorce from husband one is nullified. If the divorce is nullified, she's still married to husband one. So her marriage to husband two is not valid. He can't take custody of the children. The children go to the school, to religious school as registered. If they go to religious school as registered, the, the, the divorce is valid. Therefore, husband two is indeed the husband. 
and therefore he can move to the non-religious school and therefore you've got to look. What is the action? What is the action? The last action that closes the loop is husband two taking the children into the non-religious school. According to Rabbi Shkop, that action is not valid. Therefore, she is married. Uh, they can't go to the school. And that's it. We don't have a loop. So the Shkop principle, according to his interpretation in the Talmud, is the last action that causes the loop cannot be done. Okay? Again, note here, in modern, if you want to write this in modern uh, uh, argumentation networks where there was attacks and so on, you, you need to know which one is the last action. Otherwise, you can't model it. So, the export to resolving loops in modern argumentation is, Tell me the ordering of the actions of these. How did these nodes A, B, C got into the system? Which one is the last one? Therefore, if we want to apply it in modern loop resolving, we have to have orderings. And if we don't know the orderings, we have to, to, to write a proper program that will make sense from the modern point of view. And this is what Timothy, Tim, will show you in the second part. Okay, next example. Ah, this is another example, not about loops, but about going backwards. A very interesting one. Because you have a lot of these in the, in the Talmud. I am telling the story in a more modern, you know, I mean, in Richard Fame and every, uh, you know everybody. Um, um, everybody knows him. He likes to play the drums. Next. Okay. So what happened with him is here. Richard Feynman and his young wife, or let's call him now the drummer, lives next door flat to an old professor who likes a bit of peace. All right. But the drummer plays the drum every night. So that old professor went to the drummer at time zero and said, look, here is $10,000 on the table. That's yours in cash. On the condition, just like the divorce, on the condition that and until time one, uh, until time, uh, I mean, what happened? Time two, until time two, let's say for three months, quiet, no drums. Okay. That's the deal. In the middle of, after a month and a half, in time one, in time, just the time two, after a month and a half, the drummer dies, drops dead. Okay? So, why? Because he bought a motorcycle with a 10,000 and he had an accident. Okay? He's dead. The wife comes and says, all right, the deal is on. There won't be any drums. The first month and, month and a half, my husband did not do anything. And the next month and a half, he's dead. There won't be any drums. Therefore, the money is mine now. That's it. Three opinions. Rabbi Fisher says, yes. Yes. She's right. Why? Because there are two possible histories. History one, there's no drumming in the next three months. History two, there is drumming. In history one, there is a deal because there's no drumming in the, in the three months. In history two, there's, there's no deal. Since the guy's dead, there was no drumming. There will be no drumming. That's it. We know which history we are. We know the deal. That's Rabbi Fisher. Rabbi Shkop says, deal is off. No deal. And Maimonides, that's an interesting thing as well. Maimonides says, 
wait until the end of the three months and then there is a deal. Okay, so what's going through their minds? And you have things like this all over the Talmud. You have to construct a model that explains everything and makes sense. Right? Okay. Any questions so far? All right. And the model is this. Where is it? Rav Fischer. Rav Fischer, where is it? Where is it? I don't know. I don't remember. Yeah, you have to look in our books. Our, our book, it's probably mentioned. Okay. Uh, after, after I'll send the... you a PDF of the book, okay? I, am I mean, we wrote 15 books. The structure was Hebrew in the, in the volume and the paper, a proper published paper in a, in a journal at the end. And then we collected all the papers and made the thing into a one volume all in English. So I'll send you the Hebrew and the, okay? The English I can send immediately here. When Tim will be talking, I will find it and send it. Now, what is the model? You start at time zero. That's where the deal is. You go forward in real time, three months. The professor, I mean, uh, the drama and the professor. In the middle of these th three months, after a month and a half, the drama dies, but time continues and assumed the professor lives until the end of the three months. The model is those two shake hands, after three months, jump in time, simulated time, back to the beginning, go forward again in the simulated time, to three months forward in simulated time, and then life goes on. And that's where the deal is finished, is done. Okay, that's not how uh, Rabbi Shkop says, they both have to go back in the simulated time. One of them dies, no deal. Maimonides says, one of them is enough. That's why he says, wait until the end and then the deal, because then the one alive will go back and forward again as a mental simulated construct. And Rabbi Fisher says, no, it's too, it's two histories. It doesn't matter what happens as long as the condition is, um, is uh, fulfilled. Now, you may ask, what kind of construct is this? It works, but what's the intuition behind it? And for that, look down at the example of Henry VIII. Henry VIII married Anne Boleyn at time zero, and probably, I mean, I have no evidence, but I assume all English kings, kings or not kings, they, uh, they must have committed adultery. Let's assume he committed adultery, right? At time one. At time two, he annulled the marriage backwards, okay? Therefore, he didn't commit adultery. So he wasn't married. At time two, he wasn't married. He annulled it. But still you feel something is wrong here. Why? Because when he committed the adultery, he was married. He didn't, he didn't behave right. But if you look at the simulated time, from time zero to time two, he was married. He committed adultery. You want, you go back in time and move again in the simulated time where he was not married. So still, he can't say I wasn't married when I committed adultery. No, he, uh, you have these both, both times. And then of course you go forward after it is announced, you go forward. So this is the model. 
and you can see it here in the, in the diagram, T0 to T1, real time, and then going backwards in the simulated time, and then forward again in the simulated time, and then you go. Okay, think of the mathematics of it. I didn't develop the mathematics of it because you can, you can embed one conditional within one conditional within one conditional and then God knows how, I mean, I, I haven't done the maths. We were doing other books. Each one of these models, there, there, there's also the uh, uh, general in investigative logic of it. Next. All right. Uh, uh, next, I mean, this is the Feynman, go on next. Okay, liar's paradox. I'll go through this ve very quickly because when you give a lecture and you say I can export and so on, uh, you also have to give limitation on how you fix them. With the li Suppose we apply Schopp to the liar paradox, and on the liar paradox, you have during the Middle Ages, great minds uh, try to deal with it. In modern time, great minds, all kind of models about the liar paradox, and I think there is a lecture later on about the liar paradox. Okay, if we apply the Schopp principle, okay, I come and say, I am lying. What would Schopp will say? You're creating a loop. You are the last and only one who is creating a loop. You can't say it, right? It's very simple, but it's not the context of actions. It's, a, it's more a logical thing. So if we want to do scop here, maybe we have to develop it from a logical point of view and see what happens, okay? So following that, we looked, what do we know about applying logic, handling loops? And fortunately, uh, I've been working also on security with security people and uh, applying argumentation to security. And in, in security, there is the idea of activation. You you activate an attack. So if you look at the liar paradox as I am attacking the truth of myself, it's an attack. Then let's say it's not active. But when I say I am lying, I am trying to activate it. So let's apply modern machinery to this activation business and see what happens. And there indeed we get, next slide. Oh yes, you activate, you deactivate, and it, it works. It works in a different way. The, the, uh, the last thing is, uh, is uh, activation and it causes a loop and then you, uh, you, uh, you can ap apply scope or you can apply modern methods. They, gave you, they give the same results. But I, I won't go into it. I'm writing a paper on it and I'll send it to the medieval people to comment how how they think about it uh, yeah, yeah, you know the uh, uh, okay so so the point of this that it doesn't always have to work you might like any new a new methods you have to say what the limitations are and how you're going to deal with it next Uh, okay, I mean, this, uh, uh, these are details of how you activate on, um, on deactivate, uh, annihilator points deactivate, and if you kill the annihilator points, you activate. It's all technical, uh, but, uh, but uh, it, it gives you an, an idea. Next. Okay, now Tim will take over. What he's doing, he'll explain how Scott is modified and applied to modern argumentation networks. Okay? Okay, thank you. In a moment, but perhaps there are things to clarify before we go to the yes, second Yes, yes, okay. A question. So maybe yeah. there, are, there, there have been on the chat, there have been some questions whether it is really possible to have a condition for divorce that would you know uh, annul it just a minute yeah yes I mean, maybe the uh, my point is that from where does it start because i wasn't looking 
No, no. Uh, just, just, just the problem is how realistic is uh, in the law or the law. Ah, yeah. Uh, I mean, what they do in there modern are conditions time. of divorce that can, uh, yes, that they can go backward and. Yeah, they, they. Uh, uh, you can put other conditions, like uh, uh, I mean, there, there is a problem. If I, uh, okay, I'll t I'll tell you something else very very interesting from uh, from the Talmud. Suppose my wife and I go on a cruise in a ship, right? And then we uh, stand out on the uh, looking at the sea, and I fall overboard. In the middle of the ocean, I fall on a board, and then my wife will go and say, I am now a widow. She'll go to the court and she'll say, how do you know? Well, my husband fell over a board in the middle of the ocean. Nobody found him. They say, well, I'm not sure. Maybe he was saved. Maybe some fishermen found Who knows? They wouldn't say you are a widow. You can remarry. Okay? But if she says, now, you listen to this. If he, if, if, if she says, I know he's dead, why? Because I took a kitchen knife. I've had enough of this bastard. I took a kitchen knife, <laughs> stuck it in his heart, pulled his heart out, and to cover my, my um, cover the evidence, shoved him and everything else overboard. Okay? So the rabbis will say, yes, you are a widow. How about you being a murderer? There is another principle, which is similar to the liar. You cannot confess to your own, you cannot incriminate yourself. So 500 years of inquisition will, based on confessions will not work in the Jewish religion. So she will be a widow and you can't prosecute her. All right? Now, coming back to this widow business, I am, so suppose I want to protect my wife against stories like this. Not that she kills me, but if I fall overboard, then she, nobody will allow her to marry somebody else. So in the marriage conditions, uh, I put in that if there is any doubt or if I get killed and my body is not found or some sort of conditions will nullify the marriage backwards. You see, and I think, uh, I think soldiers get something like that. I mean, you can do all kinds of things because the idea of putting condition backwards is there. In the, uh, I think in the Islamic religion, they, they don't allow there is past and now. Don't start making deals about the future. Don't bring conditions into, uh, I mean, this is also, we try to investigate. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's so rich, all these religions. There were very smart people in the past. It's not us who are smart. They are the ones who are smart. Right? The generations go downwards, not upwards. <laughs> This is another Talmudic idea, yes. yes. Thank you. So I think there is no, mm, no need to go further because it's, but we all feel and see how rich the whole field is and how interesting are those developments. I think it's now a good moment and we come back to questions and comments to, to, for the second part of the, of the talk. Please, uh, please, Mr. Kampik. Uh, thank you very much. I will try to hold it brief um, to not take too much time for further discussion, but it's probably good to give at least an intuition um, on, the, on how the former perspective roughly works. And what we do is we um, apply this, this intuition that uh, Dov gave to argumentation frameworks. The argumentation frameworks um, are essentially just directed graphs, where the nodes um, are arguments and the edges are attack relations. And from these directed graphs, we want to infer um, potential conclusions. So if we um, take an example, here we have an argumentation framework. And this is actually an interesting argumentation framework because it highlights some different approaches of what we can do. And we have here a three cycle, so B attacks C, attacks D, attacks B. And then we have an outgoing attack from B to A. 
So, and we want now, we want to determine what we can infer from this argumentation frame. And to infer anything, we apply an argumentation semantics. And now different um, semantics families, so there are many different semantics, but uh, the main differences um, are, um, yeah, relate to the semantics families. And here we have, um, we could say in the classic semantics family, which is so-called admissible set-based semantics, we could not infer anything because there is no set of arguments that can defend itself against attackers. Then there's a slightly more relaxed um, semantics family that says, okay, this recycle, it is in itself consist inconsistent. That's why we throw it away. And that's why A is actually acceptable. So we actually can infer A. This is a ve very recent development, this approach actually. It's just one year old roughly. Um, and in, in contrast, the, the initial approach is um, more than 25 years old. And then yet another approach says, we can actually infer anything from here that is, um, that is in itself consistent. So we can infer all conflict, uh, maximally conflict-free sets from here, which would be, can either infer B or BA or CA. Um, and this is just um, the, the general problem that, that we study here. It's very, very simple, and some people say it's simplistic, but studying it can give us some interesting insights. So what do we do again um, when we have a Talmudic problem? We could say, um, as Dov already mentioned, we start, we infer, we start with, with uh, just some, some propositional atom. We infer it, and when we have a loop, we, we bust the loop. But of course, we need to have a systematic approach to this. Um, let me skip this. And uh, just to relate also to the AI part of things, of course, we could study here knowledge bases with conflicting information. So this approach that we introduce is not only useful for Talmudic approaches, but also for, for, for modern AI approaches. And of course, this is a, is a nice thing that we, we start somewhere and then we see that something is, is generally applicable. So very roughly what we see, what we do is we start with one statement, we add additional, so with one argument, we add additional arguments and then based on how the graph changes, we want to decide whether we can just keep our previous inference. And this would mean that we add the new argument to the inferred set if there's no conflict with the previous inference or we discard it if there's a conflict. Or if the change in structure dictates that we need to change our inference, we swap arguments. So, so we change our order so that's the argument that we have just added precedes the previous argument. And I will try to, um, to show this. And this is a new approach because existing approaches don't do this argument by argument construction. So let's go a bit faster so that we can have enough time for discussions. So here we would say we, we start with A and then we expand to get the argumentation framework AB with mutual attacks. There, um, there is no need to change our um, current inference. Why is that? Because there is no clear evidence that A needs to be rejected. So, and um, technically we can say the um, strongly uh, admissible set in this argumentation framework does not attack A. So essentially, if there's an argument that is defended directly or indirectly by an unattacked argument, and this argument attacks A, then we would have to discard A, but this is not the case. And then we would add C here, and again, we have a conflict here, but there's no reason why we would need to change our inference, so we'll test, we call a test function, we could say, and check if we would have to change our inference, but this is not the case. So we will end up with A. And then we can continue here and add D. With D, we don't have a conflict, so we infer D. Then if we, when we add G, we obviously don't have a conflict and uh, infer, infer G in addition. 
but now we add f. And now we have an interesting problem because what we do is we consider the partial order that is established by the, um, by the graph of the strongly connected component of this argumentation framework. We throw away all arguments that we have um, already discarded that are upstream from um, the node from the um, node in the strongly connected component graph um, where we currently uh, that we currently manipulate you could say and then we check if there's a conflict with um, the set that we clearly have to infer so the set that is um, strongly admissible or clearly defended if we just go top down through this tree and actually here if we would say a is in c is out D is in, E is out, um, then F is in, and G is out. So now we have to change our inference. So now we need to see what we do. And what we do here is we swap the arguments. So we swap, um, in this case, G and F, and we add F first and then G, and we see if that helps. So in this case, we can assume a simplification because we, we are already done with what is here, uh, what is upstream, let's say, roughly speaking. So we start with D, we add E, E is clearly out, F is in, G is clearly out, and then E um, can also not um, defeat F. And then we have our inference. And like this, we can draw inferences from any sequence um, where we, um, on which we have a total order on any argumentation. That's at least our conjecture. So we don't have a formal proof yet. It's important to say, so this is our conjecture. That this works. Um, but the question is, what if we cannot assume a total order? What if we had two arguments at the same time? And then we just say, we assume all orders that could, um, th that could be there. So if we, if we have no order at all, we essentially generate all permutation sequences and check them. So let us go through an example again. So now we take this, um, a similar example, but we assume we don't have an order. So we have this argumentation framework and we generate all orders from it. And what we then do is again, we start with A and yes, here we get A. Now what we do here is interesting to see that here we discard our inference because here we don't respect the order of the strongly connected component graph or the partial order of the strongly connected component graph. So we simply discard this. Um, here we clearly get B. Here again, we have to discard it. Here again, we have to discard it as well. Here, here it's clear because C is always defeated. And what we then get in only two of these permutations, we actually get the result. And then we say our potential inferences from this that we can draw are either A or B. And this is consistent with, um, or roughly speaking, consistent with how some argumentation semantics behave that given some graphs, there are different sets of arguments you could potentially infer. So in this case, it's quite common that you could either infer A or B. Um, what is interesting that this notion is um, well aligned with the idea of economic rationality as consistent preferences over a set. So for example, if we see um, the classical um, admissible set base or rather skeptical approach to argumentation, if we start with an argumentation framework A um, and we say that this um, inference of A would say that we prefer inferring the set of A over the empty set. And then we expand our argumentation framework to this three cycle. Then our preferences would actually be inconsistent. But in our case, we would be able to still infer A. So we would keep our, the, you could say the established preferences or the implied preferences consistent. There are also some advantages when it comes to um, how we handle, um, one could say edge cases, for example, um, long even loops. So in some sem existing argumentation semantics, 
we have some problems that we can infer the set AD from this argumentation framework. And this doesn't really make a lot of sense because it would say, if A is in, then B is out, then C is in, then, then D should be out. It's just not intuitive. And there are some argumentation semantics that um, try to explicitly fix this problem. But in our case, um, we actually fix this problem naturally because the only sequences that, um, that are, let's say, legal in our approach are actually the sequences that, that go is essentially ex follow exactly the, the line in which we can construct the cycle here. And then we can, then we get the possible inferences A, C, and D, and B, D, and F. Um, exactly. But we have some open questions here. So this is, this is late breaking work, just to show a bit how um, Talmudic logic um, relates to, to hot problems in, in symbolic AI. Um, but we don't know exactly how our semantics that we get um, behaves and we still need to compare it um, in more de detail with, with existing semantics. What we also think, and this relates to some questions that were raised, is that this approach could be used for, for example, in legal reasoning scenarios where you, for example, need to establish um, an order or partial order on the arguments that models the burden of persuasion. So that, for example, if in doubt, some argument should be um, inferred or accepted, or if in doubt, another argument should be rejected, and so on. So that's it with my part of the presentation. And let's see if we have some time for discussions. Thank you very can much. I, can I add a clarifying sure, comment? Sure. Because you had a dose of math, so I want to explain it in a very simple way. Is that okay? Yes, yes, yes. We will. Okay, so when you have two people, one says the other one is lying, you have to choose, right? Or you don't believe either of them, or, but you, you can choose one of them and say, I believe this one, he's telling the truth, then the other one is a liar. Now, suppose you have 12 people, you know, you know like in those uh, political debates, I remember with the Democratic candidates uh, a, a year ago, they have about 12, 12 people answering uh, a question. So you get a network, an argumentation network, if for every one of the candidates, every person gives you a list of other persons that they are lying. Okay, and now you have a problem. Is there a, a group there that we can say we believe them and then they will say about all the others, one of them says they are lying and we, we have no cycle. In other words, you want to have a subgroup that you believe. And the machinery for doing this is, is this math. But sometimes you can't, if you have three, for example, there's no subgroup that you can say, I believe if A, if A says B is lying, B says C is lying, C is, says A is lying, you have no way out. So to break the loops, you can use the scope algorithm, but for the scope algorithm, you have to know who is last, then you take him out and maybe that will break the loop. So you need the order. So basically it's mathematics where you have so many people contradicting each other. You make a graph and you try to find the maximal group you can believe. There may be more than one. So that's the thing behind it. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Are there any more specific questions to, to the second part of the talk? It wasn't very easy to understand probably for many of us because the, the whole idea of those little, uh, you know, pictures was not that clear. But anyway, I'm sure there are some among us, some in the people in the audience who have dealt with those issues so they can comment.
If not, then may I ask Dov Gabay, because this is just an example, you know, you, you, what you have given here is an example or a few examples, but I understand that you have uh, worked on many, many more examples of various kinds. Um, and can you yeah, give- Yeah, I can give you one more general, from- No, no, a general idea, you know, what is different with those examples from what has been known as logical systems that are- Oh, okay, uh, how about the paradox of the heap? Yes. Okay, the paradox of the heap is well known. One grain of sand is not a heap, right? You add another grain of sand, two grains of sand is not a heap, right? Now, if, if X grain of sand is not a heap, you put one more, it's still not a heap. So keep on doing it, you end up what? With a heap. With a heap, but, if you, uh, but it's not a heap. So how do you solve it? There are various solutions, many valued logics. Uh, I mean, look at the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Okay. Then I said, let's look at the Talmud. Do we have cases that look like this? Yes. It's a problem of mixtures. All right, I, I'll give you an example. You, if a wine, wine can be kosher or not kosher, never mind how it becomes kosher or not kosher, right? So you have a, a bowl of kosher wine in the fridge and for your guests who don't mind kosher or not kosher, you have another bowl above it of non-kosher wine, okay? Now you, you close the door of the fridge and you go to bed. The next morning you find that the bowl of non-kosher above the bowl of kosher was dripping, drip, drip, drip into the bowl of kosher. Okay, what would the Talmud say about this? There are various opinions, but one of them says, if it's just drip, drip, drip into a big bowl of kosher, it becomes kosher. It is lost in the majority. Okay? But, but now think what's happening with the sand. You have a big thing of sand and you say, is this a heap or not? If it started with a small non-heap non -heap, and grains sort of came drip, 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 it's still non-heap, just like it's still kosher, even though it dripped, right? But if it started with a big thing that is heap and it went out one by one, it, it will remain a heap according to, a heap according to this. So the question is, how was it formed? So if, if you come to the fridge in the morning and uh, let's say your wife comes to the fridge in the morning and she says one big of big bowl and another empty bowl above. I mean, she says, is this kosher or not? What did you put in the fridge, you idiot? Uh, sorry, I'm revealing how I am being treated sometimes. Uh, I, I would say to her, no, it's, it's kosher because I put the non-kosher above it and it dripped. So all of this is kosher. You have to know how it got to be formed. And we wrote a paper and I think we even have a book about this. All right. Uh, a lot of the Talmudic things is look where it came from and where it's going. All right, in fact, I, I was asked by Tel Aviv University to give a seminar about this, but I mean, it did, it, the students wanted to. Uh, I mean, this is a, a, I'll give you another example from a completely different area. All right, let's look at the candidate before the election. Biden and Trump. 
all right? They, they, you didn't know who's going to win, right? Before the election, you didn't know. But they, uh, there are people like, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, the, the, the Microsoft guy is worth $50 billion. The other one is uh, uh, another 50. Between them, they, uh, they, they decided to do the country some good, donated, Two hundred billion dollars to to be available. Now listen to this: to be available to whoever's going to become president to use for good causes, without having to go to Congress and, uh, and then the Democrats fighting Republican, Republican fight. No, cash in the account, donation before the election for the president that comes after the election, all right? Now let's think about this in a Talmudic way, not in a British way. The British way said you put it in an account, you put an, a lawyer to control it until after the election, then the lawyer will pass it on to whoever wins. There is no question who is in charge at any time. But that's not the Jewish way. You always have to make it uh, a bit complicated. So if you don't appoint a lawyer or nothing, you have to wait until after the election to know who is in control. But $200 billion is a lot of money. And you, may, you have to make some decisions, maybe donations, maybe investment until the end of the elections. Right? So who, who is in control there? Both of them? Both of them continue to be in control after the election, even though one of them is president? Is what, if one of them is the president, is, is he in control backwards or only from the time he started? You see, all these temporal things because you can go back and forth in time. There are various opinions about this, and we have to model how they see it, what they think. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, these are wonderful examples. There are some questions. One was is supposed to be asked by D'Agostini, please. Uh, in a, oh, I see. Is it possible to apply the rules or have you to ordering of arguments? You know, you, I suppose so. You have to interpret them and uh, ask where the argument, the thing in here is where does the argument come from? And once you know where the argument comes from, you can make decisions about ordering arguments. Yes, it's context. You need context. Yes. Uh, the, the, uh, um, the, the, uh, mm. uh, there are lots of problems in argumentation itself, and the more and more, uh, uh, you see, what is happening here, you're dealing with people. So the more and more AI and uh, logic comes more true to what people do, the more, the more you, uh, you benefit from the Talmud, because they have figured these out already, or, ma or many of these, they already figured it out. You know, things like causality, uh, like, uh, uh, I mean, you, what, who is responsible for what, what causes what, uh, um, so this is basically what's, uh, what's happening. You, you want to, model the human more and more in order to sell him stuff or to build robots to help him or to build robots to replace him. The more you do this, the more Talmudic principles you, I mean, you can, you can be helped with because they figured it out already. They really got into it. Uh, and, and sometimes you get strange things from the modern point of view. I mean, look, you may have two witnesses. I'll give you another example. Uh, there is a traffic accident. One witness says the victim was standing 
on the pavement. Okay? Another witness says the victim was not standing on the pavement. Okay? One Talmudic so solution could be semantic. It will say one is English, one is American. In, in American English, pavement is where people, where car move. And in English, English, pavement is where people move. And actually, they've seen the same thing. Fine. Otherwise, you believe one and not the other. But what if two other witnesses, two other witnesses come and say, you are witness one saying you were standing on the pavement at the time of the accident, but you were sitting next to us in an aeroplane flying to America. How could you have been there? Right? Got it? Yeah. What modern logic will say, fine, you've got four witnesses here. Four witnesses with some contradiction. No, the Talmud will say, because of the way these two witnesses come, in Hebrew it's a dim zomemim, it has a special name. If they come this way, you believe them and you disqualify the one, the alleged one that was on his way to New York, simply because of the way it is done. I don't know how to explain it. To model this sort of thing, the, 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 uh, the um, sequences of the witnesses. But that's the way it is. I mean, so you look at every place in the Talmud that they, they um, have something similar and try, to, and try to model what's behind it. Um, yeah, hmm. I mean, there are lots of, of examples like this. Thank you, thank you. It's very, very, it's fascinating. Uh, are there specific questions to our speakers? Um, I yeah. wanted to ask something. Um, well, many questions, but I only uh, I will only ask uh, two specification. Uh, for instance, uh, as to uh, what Professor Gabay says about uh, the network of people who uh, um, of uh, people who say that uh, the other people lie, or rather, let's suppose uh, there is a group of three um, persons, uh, three people, and uh, uh, each uh, A, B, C, A says uh, says uh, um, every every sentence, uh, but for my sentence uh, is false. Well, in this and the and the other say the same, uh, the same thing. This is the a Yablo paradox. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. If if okay. I. Oh well. My question is, uh, 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 clearly, in case of Diablo, there is no such reference, okay? Uh, but there is a sort of, sort of circularity, because of, there is a big discussion about uh, if, uh, whether there is or there, or there is not. Uh, well, your position, according to, yeah, uh, what is your position, your framework? What uh, can uh, your framework uh, say about uh, this, this particular uh, chain uh, or uh, sequential liar? First question. The, the second question is uh, that uh, uh, your graphs, this is specifically for Tim, uh, uh, do your graph are based uh, on uh, Peter Axel and non-world-founded uh, set theory? Uh, because you know those uh, pre systems of uh, errors, uh, and nodes, uh, nodes and errors, uh, or branches, uh, and uh, okay, is uh, well. Is there a set theory at the basis, a novel form of the set theory at the basis of your position? 
Okay, okay thank I, you. So I there would... are two, two questions, both about infinite networks, really. Okay, yeah. please, please. Uh, okay, I, I will. Uh, I will tell you. I will tell you some of my problems when I work on this. The uh, uh, the community, the community, including some of the people here, like Arnon Avron, for example, I think they they would want to use set theoretical means to solve the problems. So, um, uh, so if you if you have a graph and some mathematical question about it, you want to give some definitions, uh, explain what the problem is, do some set theory on it, maybe some induction and so on, and find the solution. And find the solution could be an algorithm, but the solution is qualitative. So to explain it without mathematics, let's let's look at it this way. Have a glass of water, half full. All right? Said theoretically, there is the water and there is 50%. Okay? When you say half full or half empty, this is algorithmic. Because when you say half full, you mean you intend to fill it, and when you say half empty, you intend to empty it, and it makes a difference. It, may, it makes a difference of how you are going to use it and compute with it, but set theoretically, it's basically the same. So when you show me a graph, let's say a, a, um, a cycle of three, a says B is lying, B says C is lying, C says A is lying. A cycle of three. Okay. Now, this cycle of three may appear in a, a bigger point, a lot of other points around it. But the other points around it may cancel each other and the cycle of three remain intact. But if you use an, some certain algorithms that make sense, the cycle of three may be able to be solved if you find who is lying and who is not using an algorithm. So for this, we made a manifesto, I think 10 years ago, that the nature of an object is not just all its properties, but what you intend to do with it and how it came into being. And lots of logicians don't want to look at it this way, but we have evidence that this is the case. Even in the case of the heap, we had to ask how it came into being. I mean, uh, and this is, uh, the Talmud is more al um, algorithmic, what to do and what, uh, according to this manifesto that we put forward, I think 15 years ago. And there is some evidence for, uh, for example, um, uh, um, in, in Rome, Fiora Piri at the time, she won a competition for robots recognizing, you see a person lying. Is he an injured person or is he just fellow sleeping in a card box? And she won the competition. Why? And as I said, how did you win this? What was your algorithm. I mean, what did you do? How, do? how did you construct your robot? And she said, I gave the robot various ways of constructing a person from parts. No. And if the person or the body the robot sees cannot be constructed in any way, is injured. And because of that, she won. Ask, where does this come from? Uh, they also made, made experiments with monkeys, uh, check the neurons in their brains, and when they see half full, they think of it as action is coming. And so something happens in their brains. There, there is, I think this is, this is uh, um, uh, 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 a true, so uh, a difference uh, between uh, the way we approach the Talmud and try to model things, we get algorithms into the modeling. Oh, okay. The, the, uh, um, um, okay. Uh, 
Thank you. Thank you. Now, Thank you it, Mr. Yeah. Kampik, do you do you have want to answer some of those um, points? Yeah, I, I think um, Dorf also um, um, provides the answer for the second question because um, most existing um, approaches to, to argumentation use this static view that you you know just um, determine some set theoretical properties, but then with many of these semantics you have unintuitive edge cases. And what you can do then is you can try to find if there's another property that you can enforce and so on. And uh, so in, in this regard, you have this direction of principle-based argumentation. So you come up with principles that intuitively make sense, or even you find some empirical evidence that this is intuitive and then you try to enforce them. But we thought as an alternative, and of course it's, um, it, it might not be a better alternative, but it's probably an interesting alternative, we start with the argumentation as a dynamic process. And we just see that if we look at it as a dynamic process, even if it's not dynamic, then we go exactly back to the example that Dov just gave. We just look at all the ways this conclusion could have come, um, um, come to happen. Oh, and, yeah, my question wasn't specifically about set theory, but about uh, the graphs because uh, the idea of that sort of graphs uh, is, a, is a quite closely mm. connected uh, for me, because mm. that's what I'm saying now, uh, mm. to non-well-funded non uh, set theory. Uh, so it, it could be interesting uh, mm. to see the difference uh, mm. between, uh, I thought uh, only this it could be a suggestion if you want mm. to reflect uh, on this. Mm. Yes. I'm, I'm uh, sure. I mean, uh, Peter Axel. Peter Axel wrote a Peter book. Peter Axel. Yeah, yeah right. sure, sure. That's right. Sure. And, uh, I uh, was, he, yeah. was, uh, he was the first, probably, who uh, devised uh, this idea of uh, uh, pay attention because uh, it was a situational semantics. It was inspired uh, by Barais and Etchemendi. And so yeah, yeah, it is yeah. a very, very uh, interesting and in a sense dynamic idea of set theory. Yeah. Uh, so it is interesting how it's, there is a, in your position, there is a sort of shift from that position to another position in which uh, set theory is not longer. Uh, okay, okay. I'm uh, going to tell you a secret, yes. Okay, thank I'll you. I'll tell you a secret. <laughs> thank you so much. All right. Take okay. a graph. Okay. And do set theory on it. Fine. Now yeah. do an algorithm on the graph. Uh, yeah, now sure, take sure. this in. You can turn it again into set theory. You say there is a sequence such that there is existence. Yeah, yeah. yeah there is okay. a sequence and uh, each point to, my, to the other point is connected like this and it goes on like this yeah. and uh, you're back at a higher level. Yeah. So if you want, you can do it. But yeah. The people who do it and the logic programmers used to used to uh, fall into this trap in the in the in the eighties. There, there is you have to have distinction between meta level, object level, meta meta level, yeah, yeah, sure. and uh, the whole of humanity. They 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 mix them too much and get confused. Yeah. Yes, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll give you a very simple example. Yeah, thank you. You, you want to promote, I was a head of department a long time ago. I wanted to promote three people to professors. I went to the rector and said, look, they have done very well. Here is the evidence. Here is the letters. Promote them. And he said, I can't. I don't have the money. Now, having the budget or not having the budget is meta level. It yeah. doesn't, is not connected with the fact that they have earned their promotion. It's a different, different yeah. argument from a higher level. So I said this to the, to, to the rector and I said to him, I said to him, uh, okay, promote them, but don't give them the money. 
at least they can say we are professors. And then he says, they can't. The administration doesn't work like this. Another meta-level problem, bureaucratic yeah. <laughs> problem. So I said to him, okay, I'm resigning. I can't accept this. He said, you can't resign. I said, you don't, I don't have the authority. He said, you can't resign. So I said, when you go to the doctor and say, I'm healthy, he say, don't say you're healthy. I'm the doctor, I will tell you. But if, you, if I say I'm dying, don't tell me I am the doctor, I will tell you. I just dropped dead and I left the room. Uh, so that was a total confusion of object level, meta level. At, at, at the end, we compromised like anything in life. He promoted, I think, I think one or two. I, I don't remember what it was. But he didn't say, I don't have the money, I can't do it. Let's, uh, they, uh, you, you have this mixing of levels. And um, for a long time, the logic programmers thought that they were, they were doing classical logic. And, and classical logic can do everything. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you can take classical logic and describe everything. Yeah. So washing dishes is logic. Why? Because you describe in logic, take this, wash, put here, break it, do this and do that. Uh, I mean, you can describe pizzas in logic. So, uh, but it's meta level. It's, a, it's just working as a language to describe something else. Object, object level is a, is, a, uh, is a different thing. So if you want to stay in the object level, then you put some algorithms and do, have principles like this and do yeah. that. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank I think you. we, we so it's, now it's like an hour and a half since our beginning. I think it's a good time to to think about ending the the session, unless okay, there thank is you. something to to very, very important things to say by the speakers or maybe by Jean Yves or other colleagues. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you to everybody. Uh, so the, the session has been recorded and uh, Hodge uh, with uh, managing the technical production will put the, this, uh, this uh, video on the, on the YouTube channel. And uh, the next uh, session of the webinar will be uh, July 14. Will be on uh, Entrepreneur. Logic of Chopanara. Okay, thank you. I, I want to say something on, on behalf mm -hmm. of many logicians to John Eves. He made the effort to make, uh, what was it, January 4th? Yeah. Uh, the Universal Logic Day by UNESCO. Now, this is something. This is absolutely something. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dov and uh, also Tim, Stan, Martin and Ricardo and uh, we'll go on.